So maybe the first question would be, in patients that you feel are more suitable for surgical intervention, maybe right off the bat, such as the ones that have ventral CSF leaks or CSF venous fistulas, do you still think that it's worthwhile patching those patients? And uh, what has your experience been in terms of the success rates for those cases? Yeah, I think, uh, so patients who come in through our ER or our local with, with ventral leaks, uh, just with a, you know, a, a routine high volume two-level blood patch, if you get them early on, like within weeks, right, within two, three months, maybe six months, I think there's a really good chance of fixing that. I think if it's been more than three or six months and it's a ventral leak, uh, we, we don't really, really advocate for any sort of percutaneous treatment. And I think the reason is that uh, there's been some um, a modification of the tear. It won't really heal anymore with time becomes epithelialized more. Uh, so that's in addition to having a little bony spur. So even if you have a you know a big bony spur, big osteophyte, but you get to that leak early on, uh, there's a really good chance of sealing that. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, the other interesting question that's come up is uh, what leak type is the most common that you see after sports injuries, such as golf, for example? Um, and is there a correlated location for the leak typically in those cases? With golf, yeah, um, I don't play golf, but uh, yeah, we've seen a few patients who who get it after you know playing golf or any sort of sports activity, uh, and I think that's more more common to have a, a ventral or lateral tear in those patients. Part of that is that uh, that patient population skews a little bit younger. Uh, the patient population of meningeal diverticula or CSF venous fistulas. Uh, skews a little bit uh, towards the older population. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you see differences between iatrogenic um, and spontaneous spinal CSF leaks? For example, do they look different on surgery or is there any way to tell um, the differences? Yeah, they look, they look very different because the uh, iatrogenic leaks are either uh, leaks that are caused uh, you know, during spine surgery uh, so then it's usually like a little flap that was caused by uh, the surgeon's instrument. Uh, that's usually more acute, right? They'll recognize it at the time of surgery. Or if it's from a, a lumbar puncture, uh, then you can see like a little pseudomeningus seal, like Dr. Carroll showed me earlier. Uh, or if it's uh, in the ventral, if it went through the ventral dura, uh, it's not so much a tear, it's really more of a perfect little uh, uh, circle, uh, circular, uh, circular uh, dural defect. Um, gunshot wounds, of course, you know, are very different. Those can be, you know, very, very difficult to 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 deal with. Um, but even those usually get better. Um, I just put some artificial dura over it. Don't even attempt to suture it because it's such a devastating injury. I put them on high dose diamox for a few weeks, and the combination of that seems to you know, help seal those leaks. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Another common question that's come up is um, for patients that have had multiple blood patches and receive uh, temporary improvement, what would be your suggestion as kind of the next uh, step in their management? Um, so multiple blood patches that do provide relief, but the relief is only temporary. Yeah, I mean, I think that really depends on the situation, right? So if you have uh, somebody who uh, who has an identifiable leak, right? So one of the three different types of leaks, then uh, you can go to uh, fibrin glue. Again, it depends on the timing of the leak. And if that doesn't work, uh, do surgery. If you're more talking about somebody who, uh, who has epidural blood patching done, uh, doesn't cure them, and all the scans are normal, right? Brain MRI is normal. Uh, spine MRI is normal, then it becomes, you know, more difficult. Um, sometimes we do this dural reduction surgery. The success rate of that is not particularly high. Uh, we recently looked at uh, 60 patients who we examined with uh, DSMs, uh, 60 patients who had normal brain MRI, uh, no leak on a CT myelogram or an MRI myelogram, and we found uh, CSF venous fistulas in six out of those 60 patients. Coincidentally, half of those 60 patients had 
uh, meningeal diverticula, and the other half did not have any. And we only found CSF venous fistulas in those who uh, who had meningeal diverticula. Okay, excellent. Uh, another question that's come up is, um, I guess there's a potential, some confusion about uh, patients that have had surgery in the spine in the past and uh, whether it would be uh, okay or fine to go back in the area of the surgical bed and potentially provide a blood patch or should those areas be avoided? Yeah, it really depends on the type of surgery. I think, uh, uh, I, I agree really with one of the previous speakers, it's, it's difficult to uh, to do blood patching where there's been an extensive uh, laminectomy or spinal surgery. Uh, if there is a leak from previous spinal surgery, right, what we call a pseudomeningocele, so there's a, a you know, a fluid collection, uh, then you can uh, place a needle in it, aspirate the fluid, and then uh, place glue where you think the hole is. And I think the, the group from Duke looked at that a few years ago and I forget exactly what it was, but they thought if the dural defect is smaller than uh, three or five millimeters, then you can uh, most of the time successfully treat that with glue. If it's larger than that, then the patient will uh, most likely end up with surgery. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And the, a related question that's come up as well is that if patients have arachnoiditis, adhesive arachnoiditis from past uh, surgery or other um, interventions, would you recommend that um, they proceed with additional interventions or would you have any other recommendations? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if somebody is symptomatic from a leak, whether or not they have arachnoiditis, uh, uh, shouldn't really influence your decision too much because, you know, if it's the only thing that we can offer, uh, then I think it's reasonable to do that. I mean, most patients I see with arachnoiditis have absolutely no uh, symptoms from that. Uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, I have arachnoiditis. Will you make sure that whoever does the blood patching or glue, you know, is extra careful? You know, that doesn't make that much sense to me. It's like, you know, when we do surgery, we think everybody might have some infectious disease in their blood, right? We don't check everybody for HIV anymore because you're always extra, extra careful. Uh, so that really shouldn't influence that decision too much, or it shouldn't really influence on how you perform the uh, percutaneous procedure. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And I think we'll just go with one more last question, which is um, a patient who is uh, mentioning that imaging has been normal, including brain MRI, full spine MRI, and a CT myelogram. And there's been no response to a lumbar blood patch. Um, opening pressure was 12. Uh, what would be your recommendation as kind of next steps in management? Well, in that circumstance, I usually, you know, have a discussion with the patient's headache doctor uh, to see if there's anything uh, that can be offered, you know, that's not too high risk. Uh, I think uh, sort of the ultimate test to see if somebody is symptomatic uh, or if somebody has symptoms of a leak is to do an intrathecal saline infusion. Uh, where a person is admitted to the hospital for a few days and we place a, uh, a, a lumbar catheter it's done by the neuroradiologist and we hook up that catheter uh, to an infusion pump. Uh, we start at a pretty low rate and then we go up every you know, maybe two, three times a day uh, just to see if the person feels better. It's really, it's a diagnostic test. It's not a, it's not a therapeutic type of regimen. Uh, and then if somebody says at a certain infusion rate, oh, you know, it's like night and day, then I think that proves that they are low on spinal fluid. Um, you might think that there's a lot of placebo in that. I think there, there isn't uh, that much of a placebo effect. Uh, and there are a lot of patients who, you know, who really believe they have a leak and we do this infusion test. They're not any better. And, you know, that's always disappointing, but uh, there also is some positive to it in that, you know, then that patient can sort of put that behind them and, you know, look for other answers for their symptoms. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. So um, there are a few more questions, but I think um, just uh, for time purposes, I think I'll stop here. Dr. Shiving, thank you so much.